is one for the history books. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 greatest medieval battles. Heartened by the presence of the True Cross, the Knights of the Kingdom of Jerusalem marched out to face Saladin. For this list, the medieval period refers to that chunk of European history from the collapse of the Western Roman Empire until roughly the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire a thousand years later. So anything outside that time and place, roughly the 5th through the 15th century, won't be included. Joan does not liberate the French, as her legend suggests. The war continues for another 20 years. Number 10, the Battle of Crécy. Though the Hundred Years' War began as a simple feud between the ruling families of England and France, it forever changed the way war was fought in Western Europe. He had an army of 14,000 men, the largest army that had ever set sail from England at that point. The Battle of Crécy was the first of England's decisive victories, and they won it by bucking the trend of relying on heavy cavalry and instead focused on a combined arms approach, the key to which was their longbow infantry. Though the French force was much larger, they couldn't compete with the longbow's firepower. And the day was won not by noble knights, but by tactical use of well-trained peasants. The bow, the longbow, holds a special significance in the hearts of Englishmen. It's the weapon of the underdog against the oppressor. Number 9. The Battle of Stirling Bridge <laughs> This was the first important victory of the Scottish Rebellion. William Wallace was besieging the last English castle in central Scotland when he heard of an advancing army and went to intercept them at a narrow wooden bridge over the River Forth. King Edward's treasurer persuaded the English commander to take the quickest, cheapest route, even though there was another way around. So the Scots just let as many of the enemy cross as they could handle, then cut them off and fell on them as they struggled in the marshy ground. This narrow structure was a key part of Wallace's plans. The remaining English forces smashed the bridge and retreated. He had his carpenters undermine the bridge the night before. And he let the cavalry go through and then did the bridge and separated them from the infantry. Number eight, the Battle of Mohi. The Mongols' objective was the great flat fertile plains of Hungary. There, they could graze their horses before moving deeply into Europe. Though several of Hungary's neighbors had succumbed to Mongolian attacks, many nobles would have preferred to see their unpopular new king defeated rather than risk their necks against what they considered a minor threat. Turns out they were super wrong. Soon the Mongols poured through the valleys and down onto the Hungarian plains. Troops were mobilized to Mohi, and the first few skirmishes went well. But by the time the full Mongol force finally revealed itself, the Hungarians had been lured even deeper into their false sense of security. With tried and tested tactics, the Mongols drew the European cavalry out into the open. Almost the entire Hungarian army was destroyed, and the ensuing countrywide devastation saw up to a quarter of the population slain. Europe took the Mongols a little more seriously after that. Soon after, Mongol patrols reached to the very walls of Vienna. Indeed, no army of any consequence stood between the Mongols and the Atlantic Ocean. Number 7. The Battle of Hattin. 88 years after the end of the First Crusade, Europeans ruled Jerusalem. But the Kurdish Ayyubid Sultan Saladin controlled the surrounding territories. Crusaders make poor neighbors, and after diplomacy failed, both sides mustered their largest armies yet. Now, at Hattin, he would confirm his authority amongst the other Arab leaders by unleashing his great Islamic army on the Franks. Though Saladin's was larger, he drew away to attack undefended Tiberius and lured the Crusaders from their fortifications. At Hattin, Saladin destroyed the bulk of the Franks' army. On open ground, Saladin cut off their retreat, harried them long enough to force them to camp without water, and lit fires around them to dry their throats. The next day saw a vicious back and forth. Some crusaders escaped, many died, and the rest surrendered. Saladin then conquered Jerusalem, prompting a third crusade. <laughs> Number 6. The Fall of Constantinople In early 1453, Constantinople was on the ropes. Constantine paid gold to his enemies in an attempt to keep the peace. 
Mehmet watched Constantinople run out of money and refused to renegotiate the terms. Cut off from their allies and with Europe reluctant or unable to help, they were pretty much on their own. But they weren't beaten. Yet. Their walls were among the best in existence, and they had run a giant chain across the Golden Horn to block naval access. That said, the Ottomans got around this by dragging their ships overland across a makeshift road of greased logs, and once assembled, they outnumbered the defenders about seven to one. The siege lasted 53 days and ended with the Ottomans attacking the walls until they fell, snuffing out the glory of Rome once and for all. Leading the attack, Sultan Mehmet II. Scholar, warrior, obsessed. Number five, the Siege of Orléans. 91 years into the war, England controlled northern France and just needed Orléans to begin invading the center. Their assault started off well, but soon lost momentum. So they decided to starve the city, building a loose ring of fortifications around it. Not much happened for the next six months or so. That is, until one Joan of Arc arrived with reinforcements. Joan's arrival with more troops tips the balance in favor of the Orléans and the French. They attack. Prophecies had been swirling about her, and her presence galvanized the citizens to take up arms. With her, France dismantled the English siege, fort by fort, forcing them to abandon the whole endeavor. And there, Joan's legend began, inspiring the French cause to be reborn. And the fact that she comes back very quickly, seemingly unhurt by this wound, has been used as a miracle. Number four, the Siege of Jerusalem. Finally at Jerusalem, the First Crusade was in tatters. Functionally leaderless and with several powerful lords, the ones who hadn't quit by this point, all vying for control. Moreover, the surrounding countryside had been stripped bare, meaning no food, water, or lumber for siege equipment. Food had always been scarce, and they had the expelled Christians to feed as well. The first assault failed, but coincidentally, a bunch of Genoese sailors soon appeared, and with nothing better to do, they dismantled their boats to build siege engines. We took the ladders and lashed them to the battlements of the city. An amazing number of men began to climb. Equipped and restocked, the Crusaders launched a two-pronged attack that breached Jerusalem's walls, resulting in an excessively brutal civilian massacre even by medieval standards. Hard to believe this was the most successful crusade ever. Number three, the Battle of Agincourt. After a couple of generations of mandatory archery training, English longbowmen were truly a potent force by this point in the Hundred Years' War. The only way of getting an army that was strong was to increase the proportion of archers in it. Outnumbered and in a race against time, Henry V's army chose a position at one end of a muddy field with forests protecting their sides, forcing the heavily armored French knights to slog through mud under a hail of arrows. When they finally reached the English position, the few exhausted survivors were easily beaten, some only needing to be pushed over. By this time in history, both nations were increasingly relying on professional soldiers like we have today. And England's archers proved that to be the way of the future. This story shall a good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world! Number two, the Battle of Tours. This one pitted the Franks and Burgundians against Umayyad Arabs and Berbers invading from the Iberian Peninsula. The Moors want to expand their empire and import their faith in Mohammed. By avoiding the main roads, the Franks managed to intercept the Umayyads by surprise, choosing a defensible position right in their path with trees to mask their numbers. But there, the commander of the Frankish army stood guard waiting patiently for the enemy to strike. In a tight phalanx, they needed only to wait for their opponents to either go home, freeze in the coming winter, or else charge uphill through rough terrain, which they did and ultimately failed. Abdurrahman may not have been paying as close attention to Charles Martel as he probably needed to in this case. The Franks probably didn't know this, but they were likely the best defense Europe had at the time. It was his stunning victory at the Battle of Tours that earned Martel the nickname Charles the Hammer. Before we unveil our number one pick, here are some honorable mentions. <laughs> Number 
one, the Battle of Hastings. We were fired up, blood was boiling, we were ready for it, you know, we were gonna let it come to us, and when it came, then there would be hell to pay. Following the death of a childless king, several challengers arose to claim the crown of England from the dead king's successor. What actually happened in practice is that as soon as Edward dies, the throne is usurped by Harold Godwinson. Having deflected one set of invaders from Norway, the Anglo-Saxon defenders then had to rush south to face the Normans. Two different leaders, two very different styles of fighting. Though they held the line for most of the day, the more experienced Normans lured them into a charge, then fell upon them and secured victory. It was important because it meant that the English vacated the hill which the Normans had been attacking during that day. If the subsequent rise of the world-spanning British Empire resembled Roman practices more than Scandinavian ones, it can be attributed to William the Conqueror bringing England back under the influence of mainland European culture. It was a quite a question. The battle was won by the better, better leader on the day. Do you agree with our list? What other medieval battles shaped European history? For more historical top tens published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. And tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom!